The regular meeting of the Minneapolis Audit Committee will now begin. Hi, welcome to the regular meeting of our Audit Committee for June 28th, 2021. I am Lene Palmasano and I chair this committee. As we begin, I will note for the record that this meeting has remote participation by members of the Audit Committee and also city staff as authorized under Minnesota statutes section 13D.021 due to the declared local public health emergency. The city will be recording and posting this meeting to the city's website and YouTube channel as a means of increasing public access and transparency. This meeting is public and subject to Minnesota open meeting law. At this time, I will ask the clerk to please call the roll so we can verify a presence of a quorum. Committee member Fletcher. Here. Schrader. Here. Fisher. Musich. Present. Johnston. Present. Committee member Fisher. Chair Palmasano. Present. There are five members present. Thank you. Let the record reflect we have a quorum. I anticipate we'll get Mr. Fisher into this call momentarily um, and we'll let him speak up uh, when he does. Colleagues, our agenda is before us. May I have a motion to adopt the agenda for today? So moved, Johnston. Second, usage. Thank you. Uh, that motion has been moved and seconded. I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on committee member Johnston's motion to adopt the agenda. Committee member Fletcher. Aye. Schrader. Aye. Fisher. Musich. Aye. Johnston. Aye. Fisher. Chair Palmasano. Aye. There are five ayes. That carries and the agenda is adopted. Next, we have acceptance of the minutes from our last regular meeting of May 17th, 2021. May I have a motion to accept those minutes? So, so moved. Thank you. It sounds like uh, Commissioner Musich made the motion and Councilmember Fletcher seconded that motion. I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on Commissioner Musich's motion to accept the minutes. Committee member Fletcher. Aye. Schrader. Aye. Fisher. Musich. Aye. Johnston. Aye. Chair Palmasano. Aye. There are five ayes. Thank you. That carries and the minutes are accepted. Our first item of new business, item number three, is approving an amendment to the 2021 Annual Risk-Based Integrated Audit Plan by adding the civil rights body-worn camera audit process and postponing some MPD projects due to ongoing investigations. To present that, we have Director Ryan Patrick from Internal Audit. Um, go ahead, Director. Thank you, Chair Palmasano. Um, We've got the PowerPoint, Can pull it up now. I'm gonna to discuss today uh, modifications to the audit plan. Uh, you can go to the first slide. Uh, so three, uh, three points to make. Uh, we created our MPD projects back due to a rapid risk assessment uh, last summer uh, in the months that followed, there were a variety of activities that led to investigations. So we know we have the Department of Justice, uh, the State Department of Human Rights, uh, an after action review, um, and others going on right now. And therefore, I don't want to expend audit resources to do work that may be preempted by one of these investigations. Uh, we should know more in the future what those will cover and their timelines. But I would recommend that we uh, amend the audit plan to move some of those further back just so that we're not duplicating work that would be preempted by a larger investigation. Uh, so that would mean modifying those dates, pushing them back to, to a later bit, uh, uh, later in perhaps next year. Uh, the third point is that we are moving several items off of the plan with this amendment. Our COVID phase three project, uh, you'll hear more of a description in the auditor update. It's a significant multi-part project covering the entire enterprise and a, and a wide variety of activities. 
uh, and rather than use those resources to cover something that might be covered elsewhere, I think it's important to uh, dedicate most of our staff time and what we have to covering this phase three COVID project. Move to, move to the next line. Uh, the second modification was we had a request for assistance that was sent to the to myself and to audit chair Paul Masano for a consultation. If you remember last year, um, I presented our brief consultation. It was a, uh, a a rapid kind of consultation with the Office of Police Conduct Review uh, related to the temporary restraining order that established a body worn camera audit requirement for that office. Uh, it's taken some time, but they've hired their body worn camera audit staff. Their background checks are cleared. They're in place and they're they're ready to start working on that project. And therefore they've requested our assistance again now that they're actually in the um, ideation phase of how this is going to work with the staffing that they've got. Uh, so they're asking for our assistance given that they're going to be doing audit work to help them establish their program, lend our expertise, and uh, just provide in general a consultation. Uh, so I'm recommending we add that formal consultation to our audit plan uh, to begin in quarter three. Move to the next line. Oh, this is the BWC uh, audit. I, I got ahead of my own slides. Uh, so yeah, that high level outline was presented back in 2020. Um, and this is to assist in developing their risk assessment and planning their first type of audit work um, to help comply with the temporary restraining order. One more slide. So you can see uh, we have two completed audits at the top. The highlighted, um, those, those are we presented now. The highlighted one is the one we'd be adding. And next slide. These uh, three MPD projects would move to the whole bucket until we have a true understanding of what the scope of the MDHR and Department of Justice recommendations, if any, are at the end of their investigations. Uh, so move back one slide. Um, so we have currently three projects in place uh, that we're working on right now, and we be, plan to begin others. You'll you'll hear about that more in detail during our auditor update. I'm happy to answer any questions related to this. Thank you. Um, I have, as Director Patrick noted, been a part of some of these staff level conversations about these changes and I'm comfortable with it, but I'm curious um, what questions my colleagues might have. Councilmember Fletcher. Thank you, Chair Palmasano. Uh, and thank you, Director Patrick. Uh, for these recommendations. I I am of two minds of this, and I guess I just want to ask a couple clarifying questions because on the one hand, I fully recognize uh, the intensity of the federal and state uh, investigations that are delving into the same territory as the audits that we've proposed in many cases. Um, and I'm aware, I mean, we just dedicated additional resources uh, or in the process of uh, dedicating additional resources to uh, that effort, recognizing that it's already overwhelming uh, staff in the city attorney's office. So there's a good reason to uh, sequence these things. It is also important to me that the council not be abdicating its responsibility for oversight, uh, you know, in this regard. And so I guess the question of whether this work feels duplicative uh, depends a little on how much we're able to uh, be in conversation with those other investigations or how much we're able to access their work product or or uh, you know their their findings to our benefit are, are you in do you have an ability to coordinate with them or to share um, information and insights with them or is is this uh, a sort of an entirely separate track and and we're just stepping back to make room for uh, these outside investigations. Uh, Chair Paul Masano, committee member Fletcher, that, that's an excellent question. I, I have not been in contact with them but hope to have the opportunity to do so and kind of in line with that I don't I, I'm not aware of necessarily the scope of some of these projects and what their recommendations would be. Um, rather than removing these items from the audit plan, I want to keep them on there because we prioritize those based on what we heard during our risk assessment and we what, what we thought was important to cover. 
uh, if we don't see that those same topics are being covered in, in the work that is currently ongoing, I would expect to move those back onto the plan. Um, but as auditors, we frequently rely on the work of other departments that meet our criteria uh, to kind of remediate or provide input into uh, the risk assessment and controls in place. And so I would like to see in more detail what those investigations will cover, uh, but certainly not abdicate the responsibility we have as an audit department to address the relevant risks to the organization. Uh, hopefully we'll have more opportunities to discuss with with those entities what they're going to cover and I'll, I'll have a better understanding and can update accordingly. Thank you for that. Yeah, I think it's worth continuing to um, develop a clearer understanding of uh, of the work in progress to see if there's anything uh, that that feels like a lane that's not that nobody else is in that we ought to be uh, pulling back forward. So I can support these recommendations today, but I, I do want to make sure that we're not, uh, you know, this is all pretty important stuff and this is stuff that we're hoping will inform uh, uh, public policy. So I, I, I do hope that uh, uh, we, we pay close attention to making sure that the information is there to inform policy, whether it's coming from us or from, uh, from the state or the feds. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, I do want to mention that we've been joined by committee member Fisher. Mr. Fisher, do you want to just speak up because we need to audibly hear you to note you is here for the record. I am here, Madam Chair, finally. Thank you. No problem. I know you had some difficulty accessing um, the meeting. Council member Schrader. I just wanted to clarify, if I, um, Madam Chair, that uh, I did not receive a link for this meeting and so I was unable to log on. Sure. Um, no, I apologize for that, and I am glad we have it corrected now. Council Member Schrader. Uh, thank you, Chair Palmasano. Uh, Director Patrick, I had, I had a couple of questions. I, I think to start out, this makes a lot of sense. I really appreciate your efforts to, to make sure we're using city resources the smartest way possible and not being duplicative in our efforts. Um, my questions really lie in like how much risk is the city at? Uh, it's my, maybe you could talk a little bit about how the Department of Justice investigations, as well as the Minnesota Department of Human Rights, their investigations look at past history. And where I'm going with this is, um, how is the past history, and even the, the most recent past history going to be, you know, look um, kind of factored into the recommendations? My concern is that with very little happening um, and change in, in NPD procedure and policy, in the recent time that that's going to be held against us by the state and by the federal government. And so my concern with not um, of not having us kind of city audit process is we're missing an opportunity to get ahead of some of these investigations um, and maybe reducing some of the risk to the city and in, in cost and monitoring um, as well as being able to fix problems you know now that are causing real harm to residents of our city. And Chair Paul Masano, Committee Member Schrader, we, I think if we understood the scope and what those projects were covering and, and some of their timelines, it would really help us assess how our projects fit into that. Um, given the scope of some of the work that we want to do and the size of the audit team, I'm not fully confident that we would complete the work before they would. And if our recommendations came out and either were the same or um, contradicted in some ways the ones that that came out of those organizations I would assume that they would be somewhat preempted our, our recommendations would be preempted by those uh, if I had a better handle on those timelines and exactly what they'd cover I'd feel more more comfortable doing that work and putting it on the plan but I'm just not fully confident that we would our timelines would match up in a way that's helpful to the city with them kind of on top of that projects that we do could take longer just based on the volume of requests that city attorney's office is getting, the police department's getting. Um, they're going to produce a lot of data for those and that data may also be beneficial if we're also getting the information on kind of a later date might be beneficial for us to continue to do our ongoing risk assessment that we're doing constantly like we are today and updating the audit plan. So. Hopefully as a as kind of a clearer picture shapes up of what's going on there, we can 
balance our risk assessment with what those those items will cover. Thank you, Director. That's really helpful. Thank you. Uh, I'm not seeing anybody else in the queue for questions and com or comments. Um, I think this conversation was helpful to kind of put it in context um, and understand a little bit more about why we're making this suggestion. I will go ahead and ask the clerk to call the roll on item number three. Committee member Fletcher. Aye. Schrader. Aye. Fisher. Aye. Usage. Aye. Johnston. Aye. Chair Palmasano. Aye. There are six ayes. Thank you. That carries and that motion is approved. Colleagues, our second item of new business, item number four, is receiving and filing and publishing the MPD Field Training Officer Program Special Report. For this presentation, we'll start off with Director Patrick. Welcome, Mr. Patrick. Thank you again, Chair Palmasano. Uh, today I'll be presenting the results of our Field Training Officer Program special project. Uh, we have several guests in the audience from the MPD, and one of them is our, our primary point of contact on this project. Uh, someone you all likely recall from the Sexual Assault Kits project that we did back at the beginning of 2020. She feels so long ago, but was just at the beginning of last year. Uh, and that is Commander Darcy Horn. She's the new uh, commander of the training unit. Uh, I believe she's on the call and I'd just like to extend to her just a brief opportunity to uh, address the committee before I, I delve into the topics. Good morning, Good morning. Commander Horn. Thank you, Chair Palmasano, and thank you, Director. I just wanted to take a, a few moments and uh, thank the audit team for their work on this project. It is a very important project to MPD, and um, we appreciate the time and the effort that they took. Um, the uh, interviews with the FTOs we found very valuable, and uh, the observations that the team made mirror very closely with ours. So uh, we look forward to working with you on this project. Terrific. And Chair Palmasano, was the, were there any other announcements before I start? Otherwise, I can move into the report. No, I do have um, a statement from the chief that he sent last night. He's not able to be here himself, but I think I'll wait until after your presentation um, before I read that. Thanks. Great, thank you. So I'm going to first start with the background on the project. Uh, we can move to the next slide. Uh, so first on the field training officer program, the police department requires all officers who are going to move into uh, the MPD and work in the field to pass the field training program. This includes uh, lateral hires and uh, basically anyone who's going to work in the field. And why it's so critical is it's the first opportunity uh, for these new folks to get an opportunity to be out on the, the street and working in the actual environment that they're going to police in. Uh, it's a phased approach to responsibilities. So the, the once someone's in the FTO program, they start out essentially as an observer and each phase along the way, uh, they gain more and more responsibility to the point of at the end of it, they are to be able to handle and work calls uh, by themselves. So they are able to perform as an able car or a one person car with a monitor uh, watching them. Uh, through this, every shift they have, they receive daily grading and along with that mentoring from the field training officer. The next slide. So our objective uh, for this project was to review this program, evaluate current practices and identify potential process improvements. And so what we looked at were, were three portions of it. The criteria for selecting field training officers, the ongoing monitoring of those field training officers, and the appraisal of recruits or officers in training. Those are the three main uh, topics we looked at. And the criteria that we use when we're conducting a project like this, so a special project, a consultation, what do we, how do we use to measure success or what the department's goals are? 
are the goals that they've established. So in the report, you will see uh, the major signposts for what the field training officer program considers uh, for success. Uh, and that is the specific criteria we use to evaluate these, these practices. To the next slide. So just clarification of some terms because I, as much as I would like to not slip into using acronyms, I, I'm afraid I probably will throughout the report. Uh, so just the four major ones you'll hear. OIT is an officer in training, so that is the new hire who is moving into the role and is being trained in the field. The field training officer, FTO, that is the trainer, that is the officer who's riding around with that, that trainee. The field training sergeant is the person at the precinct who is overseeing the what field training occurs in that precinct. You'll probably hear me refer to the rope form, a recruit officer performance evaluation. So this is the scoring sheet. This is that daily sheet I mentioned that they use to um, score in a, a training officer, um, officer in training as they go about their day. Move to the next slide. Uh, we'll talk about results now at a high level, so uh, and I'll go into each of these in turn. Uh, so there are four four major issues with a number of sub issues within them. Uh, you can see all the bullet points in the report. I can't cover all of them here. There were there were quite a few, but I would encourage you to read the report, and I'll talk about these at the high level. Uh, the FTO program staffing and structure. So that is the larger structural question uh, issues related to it about the FTO program. Communication and information flow within the FTO program. Uh, how how does training all that type of information, the forms and everything flow around? FTO selection and oversight process uh, and enhancements to the officer and training evaluation process. Move on to the first major point, the staffing and structure observations. Move into the next. Again, at a high level, the uh, what we looked at, uh, discovered, and and reviewed, uh, the FTO program is very decentralized with the main responsibility for oversight and kind of daily monitoring on precinct supervisors. Uh, this can lead to some inconsistency and in experience for officers in training, depending on what precinct they're assigned to, who they're working with, the sergeant in charge, and just how busy they generally are can uh, lead to some inconsistent experiences. Uh, that's just due to the general nature of the decentralized program. Uh, the high turnover rate in the MPD has impacted that field training officer to officer and training ratio. Uh, so generally with more field training officers, there are more, more people who can volunteer to work with them. Fewer officers, obviously that ratio uh, Im is impacted uh, and perhaps has consequences. And then finally, the training for the field training officers is inconsistent. So some field training officers have volunteered and gotten into the program more quickly than others and have not been trained. Some people have been there longer, had training that maybe was uh, put in place a couple of years ago, but not necessarily current, and not every officer had the training that, that um, met the unit's own manual standards. The next slide. So I'll talk about the management response to these issues. These are these are kind of the action plan moving forward. And again, this is a digest and a summary of what the unit intends to do. And just like other audit projects, uh, consultations, we provide the issues. The management comes up with a, a plan of action on how to address those issues, assuming they accept them, and then uh, they. Uh, attempt to implement that plan moving forward. So this is perspective and actions that you'll see deadlines throughout the coming year. Uh, so the first is a broader look at alternative uh, field training program structures. So the field training, uh, the training unit is going to examine the various models around the country, whether those are centralized, decentralized, or, or some combination of the two ranking structures, um, duration of the actual field training program, and look at other similarly situated departments to benchmark MPD's program. Uh, you'll see in the report a discussion of how the MPD's FTO program was set up in the first place, 
Um, but this is a this is a broader look to see if some of the issues can't be mitigated by implementing recommendations or or using this benchmarking data to to improve our program. And the next slide, these are other components responding to the same same thing, but we'll have a management um, expected completion date at the end of this this section. Second is to develop an updated manual for the FTO coordinator and FTOs. The FTO, the field training officer coordinator is the person who works in the training unit and is broadly overseeing the program. Uh, the manual needed updates and once this broader look can be completed, the manual can be updated to reflect those more kind of modern current standards that meet the department's expectations. Uh, second, there are incentives in place for field training officers. One is pay. Um, that is the current incentive beyond just the satisfaction that these officers are helping train the next the next wave of officers in the field, future partners, people they're going to be working with. But incentive pay is kind of a double edged sword. If you increase the pay too much, perhaps you are incentivizing people who aren't good trainers to participate just because they are. Um, you know, they want that extra that extra pay at the end of the day. But at the same time, if it's too low, it doesn't necessarily recognize the the work that these officers are putting in on top of their normal job responsibilities. So making sure that uh, that incentive pay is set at a healthy level. Then there's also things like a visible acknowledgement, so something like a patch or a stripe on the uniform that other officers can see and recognize that this person has uh, been selected for the field training officer program and, and hold them accountable to those standards while at the same time giving that acknowledgement to what they're doing. And then the, I'm sorry, the final point on this slide, mere training expectations and outlined field training practices in a written guide for new officers. So developing a new guide that updates um, what the current standards are, which may be related to older expectations for field training officers, create a new manual and make sure that it's distributed to everybody in the program and that they are meeting those expectations. To the next slide. And so the final point is evaluating and recommending for budget approval software solution to improve record keeping analysis and reporting. Uh, there, the system itself that um, kind of supports the FTOs, uh, while people are familiar with it and comfortable with it, and perhaps it is meeting the needs of what the program has, it does have its limitations and it is older. Uh, so looking at other systems that might make for uh, better glimpses into what FTOs are doing and, and providing that feedback um, and, and getting that communication boosted so that the, the field, the training unit really has a good handle on what's going on might be uh, well served by its software. So in general, the target remediation date for these actions would be January 1st, 2022. So within the next six months for actions not needing a budget approval. Um, budget approval, obviously it's contingent upon the city approving it, so it's it's not guaranteed that those would be uh, accepted. But the other actions uh, we anticipate in the training unit anticipates those being done by January 1st, 2022. And we'll audit much like I mentioned in other projects, usually this is the starting point is the report. We'll continue to follow up with the training unit and work with them and report back to the audit committee as these pieces start to get resolved. Making sure that they remediate the risks and the issues that we've noted in the report. Uh, the second piece I'll talk about is in internal communication. Uh, so first, again, coming back to the decentralized program, uh, communication can be missed at both ends. Since the, the field training officers are diffused around the entire city uh, and they're working normal jobs along with uh, working as FTOs or, or working with officers in training, uh, communication can be missed at both ends. So FTO, kind of the centralized unit that exists in the training unit can send communication out. It might not necessarily reach the FTOs and information might not flow back up to the training unit. Things happening at the precinct being communicated to a precinct sergeant 
might not actually reach the FTO unit. Uh, so uh, an FTO could express concerns at a precinct um, and those might be raised to FTO management, but that isn't necessarily always the case. They might just be resolved at the precinct and, and the training unit isn't necessarily aware of the issue that occurred. And then coming from the opposite directions, management might make decisions, the training unit might make decisions, and that information might not be communicated to FTOs. So they don't they don't have the insight into how the training unit is operating, the decisions they're making, and therefore um, don't necessarily know that their feedback is being taken into consideration and um, can't adjust their performance to meet those management decisions. The next slide. So the management action plan for these, these issues uh, first is obviously developing communication channels, and one of the easiest ways to accomplish that would be creating a schedule for regular meetings. Uh, meeting at least monthly or um, on a regular basis with both the field training officers and the officers in training uh, in one-on-one -on -one or, or small group settings so that that information flow is always there and being communicated. There's no significant lag between when things are happening in the training unit and when it's actually hitting the street. Uh, again, updating all the documentation, outlining expectations. So there is a manual that can always be referenced that contains all of those expectations and that would be uh, provided to the field training officers and they would be expected to know that. Um, second or third is communication on changes to the training plan. So. The rope forms, which I'll talk about more in section four, uh, have a set of, of grading and um, metrics that these uh, field training officers use to evaluate trainees uh, and making sure that the any changes or, or issues that are brought up in the, the um, training unit make it to the rope form so that their officers are actually being evaluated based on the expectations of the training unit. The next slide. Uh, next is scheduling quarterly training and development meetings for all field training officers. So like I mentioned, uh, training uh, has been missed. You know, some officers have varying levels of training based on where they are in the field training officer program. So making sure that there are meetings and check-ins to make sure that everyone's receiving appropriate training and getting kind of current and always up to date training information uh, at least on a quarterly basis uh, is important to address that. And then the final bullet here, um, this has already been remediated, but uh, it's worth noting FTO management. So the, the training unit created a means for communicating priority feedback to the FTO coordinator, so to the training unit. Um, they, they've now developed a tool so that uh, information from the FTO OIT can can go immediately to the training unit. It can be prioritized based on immediate need, moderate need, uh, lower risk need. And that way uh, everybody's got a tool beyond just simply sending an email or talking to the precinct supervisor that goes directly to FTO management, and make sure that they're constantly in the loop and, and always up to date. So the target remediation date for these action items is October 1st, 2021. I think this is the first date um, in our management action plan. Uh, so that's coming up um, before the end of the year. To the next slide. So next uh, I'll talk about the selection and oversight process. So this is selection of FTOs themselves. So uh, first recognizing that current needs, needing FTOs in the training unit, uh, needing FTOs to volunteer makes it somewhat difficult to standardize the process. They're, they're trying to get volunteers and trying to get people into the program quickly. So creating a standard process at the current moment uh, is, is challenging for them, but we did note it as an issue because a standardized process creates a standard set of expectations and enhanced oversight over who is actually joining the program. Uh, and how this has played out is FTOs have been formally selected. So follow the, the application or announcement that goes out the normal channels, but also informally selected. Uh, so they're being tasked at the precinct of either filling in or volunteering for the program. Um, and they don't necessarily go through the same um, 
the same process as someone who responded to the notice and therefore they received different levels of training. Uh, you could have someone volunteering to fill in for a shift because uh, the normal field training officer is out six, so they're riding around with the officer in training. They might not have had really any training in being a field training officer. Um, they may not necessarily meet the same criteria as another officer, but they're they're filling in because there's literally nobody else who can take the officer out uh, for the the shift. And then finally, uh, we did not find a performance review process for field training officers. Uh, to be clear, there is some review of field training officer performance occurring via body cameras and some of that, but it's uh, somewhat more uh, piecemeal and less, um, less of a formal process. So we would expect to see a more standardized and regularly used performance review process for field training officers to make sure that there are meeting the department standards as they do this critical work. Uh, so the management action plan to respond to these items. First and foremost, they developed a process to alert the FTO coordinator when a temporary substitution is made. So again, that that addresses the issue of uh, people in the precinct. Uh, kind of these first two bullet points can be taken together. Um, working with precinct commands to identify the reserve officers. So like I mentioned, that officer is out sick. Who can fill in for that person? Maybe it's someone who's gone through all the training, uh, is not currently functioning as a field training officer, but can step up for that evening or, or those couple of days because they're they're in the reserve list and, and have been screened for the FTO program. That way, they, if the FTO unit or field training officer management is notified that they need a temporary substitution they can draw from that well because uh, that, that type of issue will continue to crop up just based on the nature that people aren't always available to work. Uh, and then the third point, third bullet point um, arising from our recommendations was an enhanced check of disciplinary history beyond um, necessarily what we were seeing right now. Uh, but a check of the disciplinary history, both by FTO management and then um, a review by the Deputy Chief of Professional Standards of everyone who's volunteering for the program so that um, that each of them have been screened by, by two layers of management and each applicant has the stamp of approval by the Deputy Chief of Professional Standards, who is also responsible for uh, reviewing misconduct cases and is generally in the loop on those types of issues. The next one. Uh, the next point that we noted was um, potential burnout or challenges that FTOs might face. If you are working as a field training officer, you are supervising someone who's untrained and um, perhaps enthusiastic, but they don't necessarily have the same skill set as a partner that they would be working with that they might have been working with for a long period of time. And it's a it's a lot of work. It places a lot of uh, extra responsibilities on the field training officers themselves. Uh, so you would expect them to not be working as a field training officer back to back to back because uh, that can lead to burnout. Uh, some people find it easier than others, but uh, clearly, you know, six, eight months of being an FTO can be challenging. Uh, based on current staffing, some of this is challenging in the number of volunteers in the program, but uh, FTO management should identify strategies to make sure that we're not burning out those officers leading to inconsistent training and, and just a poor experience for the officers in training. And then obviously creating a performance review process for field training officers with relevant metrics and uh, you know, a higher level of standardized review so that uh, we can ensure that each of these uh, field training officers are continually evaluated, not just necessarily when they first join the program. And then finally is, is more of a technical point, but just maintaining the FTO roster so that at a moment's notice, there's always an accurate count of who is actually a part of the program and who's able to fill in at a moment's notice. Uh, so again, target remediation date for this is similar to the, the first section. That would be January 1st, 2022. So a lot coming up for that date. Moving to the next slide. Uh, finally, this is the evaluation process. So this is this is evaluation of 
candidates, the, the officers in training, not necessarily the FTOs. So first is the rope form categories and ratings aren't necessarily current. They don't necessarily reflect the standards that we would expect of officers in training and, and therefore don't lead to quality evaluations of those officers, uh, potential officers as they're, they're learning the job. Uh, some are duplicative and many, you know, it, this is an opportunity to revisit that form and really modernize it and make it make it look for what we would expect out of new officers. Uh, the second point is just kind of a more of a technical one. Uh, recruits or officers in training are scored from one to seven. If a uh, recruit is given a four or an average score, there's no need for comments to be put into the document and therefore uh, it's less work. So if people are busy, if if things are going on, or if, if someone doesn't feel like expending energy writing comments, it's easy to score average. Now, I don't necessarily have evidence that that's occurring, but it's also an opportunity if someone uh, wants to put in comments for an average day, they they can't do so on the current form. So there's, there's some issues with uh, locking people out of issuing comments for the entirety of the one to seven spectrum. Move to the next slide. Uh, so the management action plan on this one, uh, first and foremost, is using the new uh, Chief Arredondo's vision for the MPD department values, procedural justice work, adding those components to the rope form, making sure that officers are being evaluated on those points and that field training officers understand them to the point that they're able to issue quality feedback to recruits and officers in training based on those metrics, those newer metrics. Uh, an important component of that is to obtain internal and external stakeholder feedback. So as we and the field training officer program revises the rope form, the evaluation form, important that they listen to both uh, the internal partners. So Chief Arredondo, management, um, city staff, but also external what does the community expect from uh, new officers? What do they want to see new officers learning in their program and making sure those those categories are included and officers are being evaluated on that and that management's able to review how those evaluations are going so that quality candidates are selected. And therefore, uh, the rope form, the performance evaluation form should be revised to include these newly identified categories and remove those that are outdated, trim the form down where it doesn't need to have categories and add the categories that are relevant, making sure that that people are being evaluated on modern criteria. Uh, the kind of component of this for the field training officers is they should be trained in evaluations. It's it's a skill. Uh, it's not something that we're all born with the ability to evaluate other people's work and behavior. Uh, we need training in that and the field training officers, regardless of their level of experience, can benefit from some training and evaluation, particularly if you're going to develop new expectations for the officers in training and they're going to be doing the scoring. Uh, they should have that training and and that is what the field uh, management intends to do. Uh, the unit, the management should also get feedback from the FTOs and in particular also officers, the officers in training during the entirety of the FTO program, making sure that there is that communication flowing in both directions and, and the tweaks to the programs are made based on feedback from the people actually taking part in it. Uh, and then also again, kind of tied to the first one, evaluating software options. So this this form can be standardized and, and how is that record keeping going? Um, that, that would need to be a budget item uh, if they were to implement new technology. And so the target remediation date for this is June 1st, 2022. So again, I think that's the last slide. This is the, you know, the report is the conclusion of our initial phase of work on this project. And just like every other audit project we do, um, every other consultation or special project we do, we continue to follow up with management and really where the, the benefit comes um, when there are findings is, is the management response and how they actually implement it, how the rubber actually meets the road. Uh, so we have uh, several 
key dates in there, uh, October, January, and June. Uh, so we will continue to follow up with the FTO program, uh, looking at how those management action plans are actually resolving, making sure that they address the issues that we noted in the report and reporting back to the audit committee on those like we do other projects. I'm happy to address any questions that the audit committee might have. Thank you, Director Patrick. Um, I do have a question, but before I invite my colleagues to have questions or comments about this report, um, I'd like to share a, a statement or a, a, an email that I received last night um, from Chief Arredondo about this um, about this report. And so I thought it might be most appropriate that I just read it. Um, thank you to the audit committee for your part in reviewing the field training officer program within the Minneapolis Police Department. As you know, this program is under the capable leadership of Commander Darcy Horn, who has assisted you in this process. Both Commander Horn and Deputy Chief Amelia Huffman have my full support in their management response. I'm grateful for their leadership. This report is an example of how we are moving forward as a department to create meaningful improvements that the public can trust. To that end, there are three key points I would like to acknowledge as we move forward in our work. First, we are looking at systems that provide enhanced oversight and accountability while helping build and recognize leadership skills. Secondly, we are setting new criteria and expectations for field training officers and recruits and trainees that fall more in line with my expectations as chief of police. Third, the MPD will fully, will, sorry, will support quality FTOs so that we really benefit from their skills without burning them out. The FTO program is an important step in the training of our peace officers. Doing this right is of paramount importance, not only to me, but to the department as a whole. Uh, so I thank you for that statement from the chief. I will um, invite Council Member Fletcher. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair Palmasano. Uh, and thank you, Director Patrick, for this report. I think it's uh, really valuable to have this, and I agree with the Chief's words that this is a critical uh, issue. I think that this is, uh, you know, literally a place where our theory of, you know, the, the, the Chief's theory of change, which has been about recruiting and culture change, uh, either gets undermined or gets reinforced. Uh, and, you know, I think we've seen uh, and heard anecdotally some some ways that it's, uh, that the, the, this is a place that the process is not working. And I think it's, it is helpful for the public to know uh, that there are currently uh, no uh, performance review process for FTOs, that there's currently not an established criteria for the types of complaints and discipline decisions um, that might disqualify from being an FTO. I think like, the, you know, these are changes that absolutely need to happen. And I think if we're serious about uh, moving away from uh, what I think the Star Tribune described uh, this week as a, as a warrior culture, uh, you know, into something new. I think it's very important that we um, that we look very seriously at this and that we understand that this is a place that uh, has not been working uh, the way that it ought to be for uh, for a while. Uh, and so, I, you know, I think that that feels very important. One of the things that I'm wondering about is as we try to standardize this, uh, as we as we think about standardizing this, one of the challenges. Uh, is that there's uh, uh, I would I would say that the the function of patrol is fairly non-standard. There's a massive amount of uh, decision making and discretion by individual officers, and I think the experience of patrol varies quite a lot, squad car to squad car, uh, in in terms of how the job is approached and what it looks like. Just you know, from from ride alongs and observation, it it, it feels like. Uh, many people with the same job title are working jobs that feel quite different. Uh, 
depending on how they approach it. And so I guess I'm wondering, how do you standardize a training for something with that much discretion? I, I could imagine that that many uh, people are going to have wildly different experiences. Uh, and so I guess I'm I, I'm wondering, Director Patrick, from your study of this, how much of this feels like it is it is standardizable um, given the current level of discretion, or how much standardization might be needed on the uh, on the patrol end in order to be able to train consistently uh, in best practices for patrol. Uh, Chair Palmasano, committee member Fletcher, that's an astute point and, and something that we saw certainly uh, in our interviews and our, our work in this. If you know an officer in training is assigned to work in the North 2nd precinct or is assigned to work downtown or in 3rd precinct, obviously their experience is going to be quite different. Uh, I think the first step in figuring out how to address some of that issues is to get a greater insight on part of FTO management into what the experience actually is for the officers in the field. It can be challenging just based on staffing levels. How much time um, do you have to get insight by watching body camera, for example, is a great way for FTO management to see what's actually going on. Everybody's wearing a body camera, looking at calls, looking at, at forms and whatnot. There, there's a lot of data that exists as to the experience of uh, each officer as they're going about their day. Uh, can't necessarily standardize that, but making sure that uh, officers in training are being offered the breadth and not just kind of one take on what it is to be a police officer and then being moved when they actually start work into a completely different environment and, and not being equipped to do that. Um, so while every officer in training is not necessarily going to have the same daily experience, uh, the breadth of experience that they get might might help balance out some of that. Uh, second, I it's hard to estimate at this point. I think what needs to occur uh, is the management action plan and that that broader review of FTO structures, the decentralized structure uh, certainly places a lot of authority in the precincts and in the officer, the FTOs themselves into what experience those those officers in training get. And uh, it's things like looking more broadly at what types of programs might uh, be available to MPD. How do you evaluate office, field training officers to make sure that they're, even if they can't respond to the same types of calls, they're providing consistent feedback to recruits, officers in training um, that is in line with those standards. It's those types of things that even though you might not necessarily be able to have similar days, you can at least be offering a similar experience across the entirety of the, the program. So these these types of oversight enhancements um, and at least the study period that we've that FTO management has proposed uh, should give us greater insight into that. And I'm I'm looking forward to seeing what that produces and reporting back to the audit committee. Thank you. I appreciate that. I I I, I think that really drives home how important it is to create trust in this process. Uh, you know, I think people really do have a suspicion that this is where training gets undermined, that this is where whatever de-escalation uh, training and anti-bias training uh, we can structure into a curriculum, that this is where uh, uh, an and OIT gets uh, sat down to say, well, this is how it really works. Uh, and, you know, I, I think getting to a place where we believe that um, a positive culture is being transmitted would be a significant step forward for the department. It's 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 not someplace that we are now. I think that this report documents some real process gaps and and shortcomings in the current system. And uh, I appreciate having this report and and hope that uh, uh, hope that we look at this. It sounds like there's some positive uh, intentions in that direction, and we'll be watching it closely. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Schrader, and then I put myself in queue for a question. Uh, thank you, Chair Palmasano. Director Patrick, just um, looking through the report, it didn't look like there had been any changes to the field training officer um, since you know the world saw the field training program in action with former officer Derek Chauvin. 
um, murdering George Floyd. Like that was a, a field training officer doing that. Um, I was, I'm kind of surprised nothing, and just correct me if I'm wrong, that nothing has been implemented since that time until the this audit has come out. There, there have been some changes in structure. Again, Chair Palmasano, Committee Member Schrader, there have been some changes to the program, changes to staffing, reviews of the rosters, um, and changes to some of how it's it's occurring. Uh, I think documenting those, but in the broader context of the management action plan, um, that's where you're going to see the real bulk of the change. But the what is in the report was the uh, information that we saw that existed at the time we did the research, which started at the end of last year and continued through March of this year. Thank you, Director. My 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 concern is that this is you know gravely serious. You know we had a field training officer now convicted of murder um, as a citizen of you know Minneapolis, and so I, I think um, my question would be: Are there was the field training sergeant the person in charge of? Um, you know, supervising Derek Chauvin, was they a part of this report? You know, what's been kind of done since then? Um, you know, I think where I'm going with these questions is, is, is this enough? You know, we are, you've talked, to, the report does a good job of where we need to improve a program, but I don't think we started at the level of, we have really grave, serious concerns um, about the program start just starting from there. Yes, and committee member Schrader, I think the that's why the first recommendation you see in the report and the first management response that we accept, we um, noted is a wholesale look at the structure of the FTO program. Uh, we expect MPD and they've committed to doing a, a real look into it. Um, again, that decentralized structure, it, it works in a lot of ways to give people that breadth of experience and then there are those those pitfalls where um, with that decentralized structure, you have less oversight and more decision making happening at the precinct, less coming from the training unit itself. Um, but again, we have a new um, Commander Horn is new to the unit and there's a strong commitment on behalf of uh, Commander Horn, Deputy Chief Huffman to to really look broadly at programs and what might be implemented to address the issues that you and the report raised. Thank you. That's all my questions for now. Thank you. I also wanted to mention, um, I believe there was a class in field training at the time, you know, during the end of last May and June, but then there were no classes or that kind of thing until now, basically, for training. So it was and has been a real opportunity to go and really dig through and take a look at how we want to revamp that program. Um, I wanted to mention a couple of things followed by a question because I have had conversations, informal conversations with police leadership about this audit as it's been ongoing. I, I am very excited about the results of today's audit report and I'm grateful for the rec, for the effort of, of both our audit team and also MPD. I think that the recommendations from in here are the kinds of real tangible policy changes that, um, that we can do together. Some of these recommendations take budget dollars allocated and some of these recommendations are about wellness for those that are tasked with preparing our first responders. I am curious, Director Patrick, how were alternative field training officer models selected for analysis here? Was it about size of department or um, organization of, of how um, first responders work at the precinct level? Or, or can you tell us a little bit more about that part of the audit? Uh, Chair Palmasano, just clarification question. Are you talking about how we used alternative models to benchmark MPD? Right, correct. He, he, when looking across the spectrum of cities, we did some research and benchmarking how other other field training officer programs work. There's a lot of uh, MPD's model is not unique in the the current one that exists. It's a pretty pretty common setup. I believe started in San Jose and has been in existence for a while. So um, there are other types of programs. Uh, we would provide that information back to MPD management, but 
ultimately they'll have to use that information to benchmark their own program. Um, we can propose alternatives, but it's up to MPD to really look at what might be tangible and possible here in the city. Right, thank you. Committee member Johnston. Thank you, Chair Palmasano, and uh, thank you so much for this report. I really, this is such a critical, critically important um, item, uh, the field training officer piece, and I appreciate um, Director Patrick's work on this as well as uh, Commander Horn. So thank you. Um, my question, I think uh, Chair Palmasano mentioned wellness, and um, my question is really related to to that. Do we is there a standard or a best practice related to that ratio that you mentioned in the report um, for field training officer to um, new officers and or excuse me. And so I'm just wondering if if that is something that we know of in terms of best practice and um, just I'll let you answer that question. The only other thing I wanted to mention is on the um, is making sure that as we update the manual that is very accessible to all. Um, I know that sometimes the manuals sit on a shelf and I know that that's hopefully not the case here, but I just want to make sure that that's um, addressed as well. So thank you. Uh, Chair Palmasano, Committee Member Johnston, that's uh, just to mention the second point that you made uh, was the communication flow enhancements that we recommended should address that quarterly trainings and making sure those um, changes are communicated to everybody as people come in and out of the program. They're trained up front and have that expectation set up front. Uh, the manual doesn't sit. Uh, certainly that's that's really important. Uh, to your first point, the officer in training to um, at field training officer ratio. Uh, we, there is a staffing study going on in MPD right now, but on top of that, that is one of the areas we asked MPD to look at was what is the healthy ratio. Um, part of that is determining how many FTOs uh, you need based on the recruit classes that are coming in to give people a healthy work-life balance. Uh, we did hear pretty different estimates of how long someone could work um, before they experience burnout as an FTO. Uh, so surveying the FTOs, monitoring performance and, and carefully considering that ratio should happen in that initial uh, look at department models. Um, but I, I, we don't have a exact number of the ratio currently, but you could think each, if each phase is a month um, and you have 30 odd people in a, in a training class, that's roughly 30 field training officers you'd need to have throughout the throughout the program, but one for each phase since it's a four to five month process. So the ideally you'd have a large number on the bench and you could kind of select based on both skill and expertise as well as uh, how what when's the last time they trained somebody. Um, but you need to have the volunteers into the program with proper incentives to get to those numbers before you have that. So I, I would expect more discussion on both burnout and um, that that ratio to happen in the the report back in January. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments from committee members? Seeing none, I'll move to receive and file the report and direct staff to publish this report. Um, could I have a second on that? Second, second Chair Baumsano. Thank you. I'll say Mr. Fisher seconded that. Um, Clerk, could you please call the roll? Committee Member Fletcher. Aye. Schrader. Aye. Fisher. Aye. Musich. Aye. Johnston. Aye. Chair Palmasano. Aye. There are six ayes. That carries and that motion is approved. Thank you for everybody's work. Next, we have the report of our internal auditor. Um, this will be receiving and filing an update of our internal audit department's work in progress. And I'll kick it off by turning it back to Director Patrick. Hello again, everyone. So now we'll go through our auditor update. I just move into the next slide. So this is what I'm going to talk about today, our in-progress work. I'm going to note uh, we don't have any prior audit issue follow-up or continuous monitoring updates. 
but we did have a meeting not that long ago where we had a significant number of updates on those. We'll we'll continue those in the future, but our, our bulk of our work was in the past month on our field work, finishing the FTO um, special project and, and getting the next projects up and off the ground. So we'll continue with those updates at the next meeting, but there aren't any today. And that we can go right in two more. Uh, so we are in the planning and, and moving into the actually the field work phase right now on our personal and work issued mobile device management audit. Uh, so primarily what we're looking at, this came out of our risk assessment uh, based on the fact that more people are working remotely and therefore may need to use um, their their mobile phones to to work, both personal and city issued might in, increase the risk if there are weak controls over the city's use of mobile devices. Uh, so we are looking at mobile devices issued by the city, uh, generally at the use of mobile devices by city employees to conduct city business, uh, although that is a much more challenging thing to address and any related costs and contracts. The next slide. Uh, so this is, I'm not going to read all the items in the scope, uh, but I just wanted you to have it in front of you. But really, this is a look at the overall governance structures related to mobile devices, how how we obtain them and how they're actually monitored when they're being used. Move to the next slide. Uh, we are nearing the end of field work. Uh, and moving into reporting on another piece that that kind of touches on some of the things that we discussed both in the FTO project more more in our, our risk assessment that we conducted last year. And I think this this project actually tackles some of the issues that uh, were raised in the modifications to the audit plan. I will look forward to presenting this at a future date, but we're we're moving into reporting and beginning to work with management on action plans related to this project. And that is uh, looking at when there are settlements, court awards, small claims, uh, things of those nature, uh, how are departments responding to those to address the issues that were raised in the lawsuit? Obviously, we don't want same or similar types of lawsuits popping up over and over and again. So making sure the city has a, a looking at the way the city addresses lawsuits to to plug those gaps where they exist. Uh, so we'll be soon moving into our reporting phase on this project. And I'm going to turn this part over to Huguette as a lot on our COVID phase three project. She is the project lead and our primary point, point person on COVID related auditing. Uh, so I'm going to turn this over to her for a brief explanation of what we're doing working on that project. Welcome, Ms. Sassolat. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Ryan. Uh, Madam Chair, committee members, uh, like Ryan mentioned earlier in his presentation, uh, the COVID-19 phase three project is going to be bigger than we initially anticipated. So there will be many aspects to this project and we will, we're planning to complete it in four parts. Um, in part one, we'll be assisting the health department with their after action report. So they've recently reached out to us to request assistance with work related to their response to COVID-19. And essentially, uh, there are some aspects of the report that they would like an independent party to work on. Uh, so audit will help with things like conducting uh, surveys and interviews to gather information and then we'll summarize the responses by theme and determine what went well, what could be improved and come up with a plan for them to um, to implement. So this will be a great opportunity for audit to collaborate with the health department uh, in such an important project. And um, we're waiting to receive some initial information from them to put this uh, to put together a consultation agreement. So uh, once we hear from them, we'll have a, a formal consultation agreement and we should get started on this part of the project. And for part two, three and four, uh, I'm just going to briefly talk about what we intend to do, but circumstances could change. So I will not go into too much detail on those for now. We'll just be providing updates at audit committee meetings as we make progress. So for part two, we'll, uh, we'll just entail a review of city and department 
business continuity and disaster recovery plans, uh, essentially making sure that each department has developed one and that it has all the necessary components of a business continuity and disaster recovery plan. And uh, part three, uh, I think, uh, will involve some work that was done in the city coordinator's office. At the last audit committee, we briefly went through this uh, because there was some ongoing work going there and uh, parts of it was going to be passed down to audit. So we're still waiting to hear more on that. And that will be part three of this project. And part four, I also discussed at the last meeting, is where we will look at the impact of the remote work on city activities and services. Uh, so far, we've obtained revenue data from finance and we'll use that to determine departments we want to focus on uh, when we get to this part. Um, because we'll be looking at things like uh, the availability of city services, like we mentioned, and our focus will be on those bigger departments uh, with uh, that provide more services to our, the constituents. So that's what I wanted to share uh, regarding this project for now. Uh, are there any questions or comments? Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? I'm not seeing any. Okay, all right, thank you. So I'll turn it over to Ryan to continue this presentation. Thank you. Uh, next are projects that are in the planning phase. Uh, and this is in the early planning phase, but just wanted to follow up on, this was another bullet on our three top priorities uh, from the annual risk assessment is working with the Minneapolis Emergency Communication Center uh, consultation, uh, creating a systems architecture, uh, conducting risk assessments related to system security and assessing feasibility and costs associated with their current intergovernmental agreements. MECC works across not just the city, but ac across the county and dispatch. So looking at those intergovernmental agreements. Uh, we're currently seeking assistance for this, so it's in the RFP process, but we hope to have a vendor selected to work with us on this project in the, in the very near future. Uh, so this work should be spinning up in the next month or two. Uh, and then the last piece is the biennial body worn camera automated license plate reader audit. So this is the uh, state law required every two years. Uh, this type of audit uh, we have in the past done this work for MPD as we're external to them uh, and we will do that work again this year. Looking at the the programs to ensure state law compliance. I think this dovetails nicely with the project um, with the Civil Rights Department related to their body worn audit program, uh, kind of two sides of the same coin. State law compliance, using body cameras as a tool to assess MPD's performance. The next slide. That is uh, what I have for you today. Thank you so much uh, to my team. Uh, they've done outstanding work over the last month to get the FTO report completed, updates on the uh, audit plan and uh, generally work moving forward. We've got a lot going on right now between COVID phase three assessments and the other audits we have uh, in flight. And I look forward to sharing a lot more information about those in the near future. Happy to answer any remaining questions and thank you all for your attention. Thank you for this presentation. Do my colleagues have any questions? Seeing none, uh, without objection, I will direct the clerk to receive and file that report. Um, next, are there any announcements? Not seeing any. Seeing no further business before us, I will go ahead then and declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you everybody for your time this, this morning, <laughs> soon to be this afternoon. Thank you.